Our passage this day is from the Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 46 to 52. Let us listen for God's living word to us. They came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and a loud crowd, a large crowd, (laughs) were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. Let us pray. O God, open our ears, our hearts, that we may receive the word you have for us this day. Make this ancient story come alive in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you stand in the pulpit of the chapel at Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia, and look down, there is a brass plaque attached to the wooden surface that only the preacher can see. Inscribed there is a quote from John's Gospel. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Even though it's been a long time since there were only sirs speaking from that pulpit, I love that the address is personal. No one can stand in that spot without being reminded of his or her task to point to Jesus, to help the gathered congregation encounter the risen Christ in the stories of Scripture and in the stories of our lives to see Jesus. Isn't that what we all long for, especially in this time so full of anxiety and uncertainty? Isn't that why we come here, searching for the presence of God in the midst of worship, in the kinship of this community, in the songs we sing and the stories we share? in the prayers we say, and the hope we hold. And don't we hope that together we will discover some insight or share some experience that will shed some light on our ordinary lives, or that helps us find Christ at work somewhere in this complicated and broken world. We might agree that these days there is a sense of urgency to our longing, our desire, our need to catch a glimpse of Jesus, and even to be changed by what we see. To be encouraged, or inspired, or healed, maybe. Bartimaeus, The person in our scripture reading, blind and begging, longs to see Jesus too. He is sitting by the side of the road with his cloak, his only possession. When he realizes that Jesus is near, he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The crowd 
reacts to this outburst swiftly. They turn on him. They lash out. They rebuke him for stepping out of his place. He's a beggar, after all, the lowest of the low. The crowd is annoyed by him, embarrassed by his outburst, upset by his insistence for attention, and they order him to shut up. But Bartimaeus, he won't be dismissed. He shouts all the more. He persists. He knows who Jesus is, and he won't be quiet about it. Even Jesus' disciples, his closest followers and friends, haven't yet made that kind of confession. Over and over in Mark's gospel, Jesus tries to tell them who he is, to show them a different way of life, to explain where his conflict with death-dealing powers will lead but they still don't understand. They are forever showing that they don't get it. Bartimaeus, however, recognizes what they have not yet been able to comprehend. He calls Jesus son of David, the Messiah. He says it out loud. He says it loudly, and suddenly things become clear. It's the crowd who is blind. The blind beggar is the one who sees Jesus and how he has come to upend their world. To make sure we don't miss the significance of what's happening here, the name Bartimaeus underlines it. Jesus heals a lot of people in the Gospel of Mark, but we never learn their names, not a single time until now. Scholars agree that for Mark's early audiences, the name Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, matters. Why? Because Timaeus is the title of Plato's famous dialogue, including its song of praise to sight, to the powers of reason and observation, to the things that make philosophers who they are, the people who think great thoughts and shape culture, and the ones who sit at the top of the social ladder. In Mark's gospel, however, the one on whom this status is bestowed, the one who who bears the name Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, is a poor man who sits beside the road, his cloak spread out around him to catch the coins people drop as they pass by. The crowd had assumed he wasn't someone who mattered. That was the predominant pattern, after all. But Jesus has come to show them another way to live and a different way to see. Bartimaeus cries out. The crowds try to silence him, and then the whole story pivots on the next three words. Jesus stood still. Maybe that doesn't sound so remarkable, except when you notice that in Mark's gospel, Jesus rarely stands still. Mark's Jesus is a man on the move. He is always rushing forward. The word immediately shows up 39 times in its pages. The whole ministry of Jesus is immersed in a sense of urgency. So for Mark to report that Jesus stood still, it's as if he took a yellow highlighter and wrote, pay attention here in the margins. And Jesus does. When he turns to Bartimaeus, he takes the time to ask him a question. What do you want me to do for you? It might at first seem obvious that Bartimaeus wants his eyesight to be restored. But this blind beggar already sees in a way that others do not. And Jesus won't presume to know the desires of his heart. Instead, he 
makes Bartimaeus an active and engaged agent in the story. He also sets up a vivid contrast. The question he asks Bartimaeus is the same one he has just put to his disciples, James and John, only a few verses earlier. What do you want me to do for you? Following the predictable pattern, James and John see themselves raised up above others. They want greatness. They ask for glory. They clamor for seats of honor on his right and on his left. By contrast, Bartimaeus responds simply, my teacher, my rabbi, let me see. I want to see. I thought I could see, but I want to see again. I want to see more. And then by God's grace and his own faith, He does. He can. And then we see how the insight, the humility, and the hope of Bartimaeus, the presumed outsider, outshines the dull hubris of the insiders in Jesus' entourage. For Mark, he is nothing less than the model disciple, persistent, wide-eyed, and open-hearted. Go, Jesus says to Bartimaeus, your faith has made you well. But Bartimaeus, he still won't turn away. He has already thrown off his cloak, a symbol of his leaving his old life behind. And he follows Jesus. Even though they're just a day's journey from the coming showdown in Jerusalem. As Mark tells it, Bartimaeus is the last disciple to join the fold. And as Jesus has already proclaimed in the verses just before this episode, the last will be first. In his second letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote that because of Christ, we no longer regard others from a human point of view We no longer see them the way the world sees them, in other words. Instead, we get to see as God sees. Jesus and Bartimaeus show us something of what that looks like. Through them, we see a world where everyone matters and where the lowly are lifted up and no one is left out. We see a faith that looks like courage and a hope that is audacious, tenacious, and open-hearted. We notice those begging for mercy by the side of the road in a new way, perhaps, and we do not turn away. Because we live in Christ, we try to see every person as God sees them. We give all our attention to seeing the world and everything in it as if looking through God's eyes. Jesus knows the urgency of this task for his day and for ours. Early in the American experiment, the French diplomat and philosopher, Alexis de Tocqueville, observed a presidential election in the United States. Writing about it, he described the time as a kind of sickness in which the body politic becomes dangerously feverish. For a time, emotions run too hot. The fragile forms of consensus essential for democracy, what de Tocqueville calls our habits of the heart, they evaporate. His observation from the early 1800s certainly speaks to our current time. We know the truth of it. We feel the heat, the fever, the sickness, the danger. But we've also been given the vision to see another way. And we know, we know something about the habits of the heart that cool our brows 
and will bring us the healing the world needs. Because as people of faith, as followers of Jesus, we are the stewards, the keepers of those habits, those values, those virtues. We who center ourselves in God's grace, who seek the Spirit's guidance in our words and deeds, we who believe that every human face reflects the image of God and that every person is precious in God's sight, those are the habits of the heart. The well-being of the world needs us, like Bartimaeus, to take heart, to get up, and to hear how Jesus is calling us, calling us to foster a bold faith in God that refuses to be silent in the face of wrongdoing and injustice, calling us to cultivate the habits of the the heart so that we will always see neighbors rather than enemies, so that we will attend to the needs of the outsiders and hear the voices of the most vulnerable, so that together, we will imagine new possibilities, a different world, a better world, reconciliation, renewal, justice, peace. Together, let us make a pledge. From this time on, we will see no one merely from a human point of view. We will pray to see what God sees, to look through the lens of love, to see Christ in the guise of the stranger. Jesus, when do we see you? We see you every time we encounter another child of God, every time. Author Marilyn Robinson says it this way, Who might he not be? He told us who he was. The hungry, the sick, the imprisoned, the stranger. For Christians, the incarnation of Jesus changed the world in one great particular. We now know who it is when we slight, insult, ignore, forget. The parable that is our faith, would tell us that he is always present, always waiting to be seen. And so, dear friends, let us take heart. Let us open our eyes, our ears, our hearts to the one who is always calling us to get up and follow him, extending mercy, bringing healing, building bridges, repairing relationships, renewing kindness, reviving compassion. As we face the great challenges in front of us, political, spiritual, environmental, let us lean on each other for courage. And let us look into one another's eyes and see there what God sees, a beautiful, beloved child of God. Only by that kind of seeing will we find our hope. Amen.